Mr. Bergeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. But suppose Frank was a veteran. Now, chances are, given current ages, he was. Chances are he served during World War II, maybe during Korea or during World War II. If he was a veteran and he served at least 90 days in the service, and at least one of those days occurred during a period of war, right? Just, even though he didn't go overseas, um, he qualifies for something called the aid and attendance benefit. And so does his wife or his widow. He qualifies for as much as $2,000 a month, as a matter of fact, in the age and attendance, for, in age and attendance provide in an assisted living facility, provided that, provided that he needs assistance or Mary, or I'm going to use Mary as the example, although the numbers aren't going to quite play. If Mary needs assist, assistance with two of the activities of daily living, and if that assistance is provided at the assisted living facility in a bundled payment so that she's they're getting one, one bill every month for all of the payment, and that's $6,000, right? then she, as the spouse of the veteran, is entitled, to the, the, as the ill spouse of the well veteran, is, is entitled to up to $1,381 per month. Uh, he, as a veteran, is entitled to $2,000 per month. Let's see how that plays out. Now, I'm not going to go through this slide in detail. I'm just telling you, 90 days in the service, one day during a period of war, and you qualify. Um, and, the, and a surviving spouse also qualifies if they, were still married, if they were married to the veteran at the time of death. So if you're single and you're really looking for this benefit, you want to look around for a veteran just before he dies. Um, <laughs> th there, there is a, once again, there is a medical requirement. We just talked about that. There is an income test. And the, the, the theory behind this benefit is that it's supposed to subsidize the veteran's uh, income or the spouse's income up to a particular level. So the numbers that we were using were the maximum numbers. But the key is, if you're in assisted living, you need assistance with two of the activities of daily living, you get a bundled payment every month, 100% of the assisted living payment is considered to be a medical expense, which gets subtracted from your income to determine what your net income is to determine whether you're entitled to the benefit. So for example, or in Frank's, in this case, I was just using the example if your total assisted living costs were $4,000 a month, remember their income is $3,000 a month, right? If their assisted living costs were $4,000, in this case we're assuming $6,000 a month, their income is actually in the negative numbers or is zero, which means in all cases, whoever is eligible is going to qualify for the maximum benefit, the maximum benefit. Now, there is an asset test regarding these, but the house, the home, is not a countable asset, even though you're not living in it. Even if you've moved to assisted living and you've been there for years, the home remains a non-countable asset. So the only countable asset for Frank and Mary's case is the $350,000 in cash or cash equivalents. There is, if you have more than $80,000 in cash or cash equivalents, then, um, then the VA will analyze the additional amount to see if you need that much money for the rest of your life, right? Um, we have had a case where, where actually the VA approved somebody who had $248,000, right, in, in cash or cash equivalents. But A, there's no look back period regarding these assets. So Frank, if Frank and Mary if decide to simply give away their money to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., those assets don't count. B, to the extent that a look back period gets imposed, they could, also, they could always use the extra money to simply buy an annuity. We talked about what an annuity is, simply increase their income stream and therefore qualify. Now, no, I'm not going to go through that. So go back. Remember, those are the assets. Assisted living is $72,000. The extras, they need $84,000. If their income is $36,000, if Frank is getting $2,000 a month or twenty four, dollars that means the burn rate on the rest of the money, this is assuming, once again, that they're not selling the house, is $24,000, which means they could stay in assisted living for 12.5 years, right? Well, let's, let's, let's think about what, if, what else they could do. So they've got a $600,000 house. Suppose they decide to simply go to the bank and get an equity loan for $300,000, right? That's substantially lower than the loan to value ratio that most banks employ. Now, um, in, with the equity loan, their total money is now $600,000 instead of $300,000, which means 
uh, if at using that same burn rate that we were talking about before, they can stay in that assisted living facility for 25 years. Finally, I want to talk about one more. Now, once again, there are a lot of numbers here, but we're just we're going to go through this so you get a sense of the importance of these possibilities. Um, when if they if if the payment they're making for assisted living is more is 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 as a result of the fact that they need assistance with at least two of the activities of daily living, and if it's a bundled payment, then the payment to the assisted living facility is a medical deduction for tax purposes. Now, why would Frank and Mary care about that? They have very little income. Why do they need a deduction? A very good point. But suppose, and once again, two activities of daily living and it has to be certified by a care professional. But suppose they gave their money to, to Peter. Remember, that's the New York lawyer. He's doing okay. He's making a bundle of money. He's a New York lawyer. He's also paying a bundle of money in taxes. Because New York, actually, there, if you're living in New York City, there's a federal estate and a New York City income tax. His total marginal tax rate is probably the highest rate, 40%. 40%. So if Frank and Mary gave their $300,000 or $350,000 to Peter, uh, and then Peter turned around and wrote those checks every month, uh, on Ma Frank and Mary's behalf to the assisted living facility. And if those checks added up to more than 50% of the total cost of maintaining Frank and Mary, which of course it does, because that's way more than the rest of the money that Frank and Mary are spending, then Frank and Mary become dependents of Peter. And those expenses become a medical deduction. A medical deduction. And at those tax rates, that means that for every $100,000 it, that, Frank, that, that Peter earns where he was paying 40,000 of that to the federal government, the state of Massachusetts and New York City, he now gets to keep that 40,000, right? Because he spent that 100,000, which had been given to him, to support Frank and Mary. Which means, now if Peter is a nice kid, now once again, this only works if Peter's a nice kid, right? If Peter is a nice kid and says, well, rather than just go to the Bahamas on that money, you know, uh, I'm going to actually take that extra money that I would have paid to the government and I'm going to throw it in the pot for my parents. If he does that, the effect of that is that it, it stretches um, the, the, the cash that they had um, for, to, for, to a substantial amount, right? And, and, and if you end up doing the calculation, it turns out that the total available cash, if you use the cash that they started off with, if, you take the, if they took the money out as a result of the equity loan and you look at the tax savings, they end up with $840,000 worth of money to spend on their burn rate, which means they can stay in the uh, assisted living facility for 17.5 years, right? Now, I'm not asking you to remember all of those details, but simply to suggest to you if you if there are other reasons why home or why an assisted living facility might work, and you really don't want to go to a nursing home. You may want to look at this as an alternative. Uh, the goal of all of this work, of all, everything that we do, that I do, is to have people sleep well at night. So none of this may be relevant to you. Uh, if it is, though, and you want to think out whether any of these strategies would work for you, it, you, you ought to do it. And I hope this was worthwhile. Two other things. If you thought this was just a great presentation, uh, but you can't remember everything that was said, uh, we upload this to my YouTube channel. Uh, in addition, um, Waycam, the Wayland cable station, has, it, it has indicated that they, they're going to be playing the show over. So you probably can get this the, 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 from there also. Finally, um, in the long run, in the long run, I'm hoping that by the time I have dementia, right? I mean, my, my older brother just got an early, one of my older brothers just got an early diagnosis. Once again, my mother died when she was 81. You know, it makes you get scared. Uh, I'm hoping that they will have figured out how to delay my dementia until I'm 105. As I've told people, I don't care if I have dementia as long as I'm 105, you know. Um, and they're the people that are going to help figure all of that out. Um, there is an annual walk to support the Alzheimer's Association on September 28th. Frank and Mary are walking. If you want to join us on our team, we'd be light, delighted to have you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, sir. At the very beginning, you talked about transferring of assets. Yep. You didn't talk about look-back period. Regarding transfers of assets between spouses, there is no look-back period. So in this situation, Mary needs nursing home care or wants to qualify for the frail elder waiver. She can transfer her assets to Frank on day one. Frank can go buy the annuity if he needs to on day two or not. And on day three, she can qualify. Similarly, if Frank does that will, 
All the assets are in Frank's name at the time that he dies. Even if the, the assets were transferred to him the day before he died, and his will says all the assets are going to be held in trust for, Frank, for Mary's benefit, the day after he dies, all the assets are safe. None of these, the things that we're talking about involve look-back periods. That's a common, commonly, people don't know this is available, but it, because of the spousal thing it is. Yes, ma'am? What about self-dealing? What about self-dealing? What does that mean? Um, so if you own a property that is um, land court land, yeah. and you have power of attorney, and mm -hmm. you want to deal it to yourself, that won't happen because of self-dealing. Actually, it can happen as long as the power of attorney allows self-dealing. You just, it just has to be specified. That's a, if there's an old enough power of attorney. Right. If, it's, right. if it's an old, if it's a power of attorney that doesn't allow self-dealing, then you've got a problem. That's right. In that case, in, it, that's right. And in, in, it's kind of an, in, an unsolvable problem in that the only person to whom the asset can be deeded is the spouse, which is actually some, to some extent a good reason for having the power of attorney run to the, to the child as opposed to the spouse. I'm seeing a note. Thank you. Um, I want to, and this was rude of me, I want to I wanna introduce Dixie Iman. Dixie Iman uh, from the Carriage House uh, is the person who invited us here. And I want to thank her here for, for uh, I want to, I want to thank her for doing this. Thank you. And I really, really appreciate it. Oh, and by you. the way, and, that, and now we're, and I'm running out of time, so I want Dixie to close and then we'll be available for questions if anybody has questions. Okay, great. Thank you everybody for coming to the Carriage House at Lee's Farm. As you all know, we're an independent living, assisted living, and memory care community. We have 62 apartments here, 33 in our traditional neighborhood, which is independent and assisted, and 29 in our Avita at Carriage Houses, which is how we refer now to our memory care neighborhood. Um, Jazz is our wonderful program director, as you know already. Um, I just really appreciate Arthur and Christine and Jazz being here this evening. I appreciate you coming and joining us. And if anyone would like a tour, we're always available for you. Dixie, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Can I have a quick round of applause also for my guests, my great guests? Thank you.